profile of our user. Uh, people set up their profile, they can, they can meet friends there. And with the search engine, you can go and find people that you're interested in. And also, there's this um, game, what, what we call a matchup, where you can go and basically click yes or no on people. And uh, if both are interested in each other, then it's a match, then you make friends that way. We also have a mobile app that we released a while ago. So um, it's also a pretty interesting app for people, for you to know like what other users are around, like meet people that are near you, and you can message them. So um, a little highlight about Zorpium. We currently have 25 million users, and um, all around the world, um, 278 million messages have been sent on our platform so far. Um, around 1 million users come back every month to use our website. And, um, and it's a pretty active community that we've got here. Um, again, we're named as the fastest growing social network in India in 2010. Um, we also have a fully operational um, international, uh, internet operation, ICP license. It's called the Internet Content Provider License. Um, and we're the very first social network, global social network, that has a license like that. And uh, you're sorry to interrupt. Can you hit F five on those slides that it's in the full the full screen one? Thank you. So um, currently we're getting uh, 5,000 to 10,000 users every single day. And uh, over half of the company staff has been with us for more than five years. And so basically I'm just going to be here and talk about my little stories and uh, share with you guys how I got to where I am. Um, so first of all, I'm going to um, just talk about my personal background first. I'm from Hong Kong, born and raised here. Um, and uh, I remember when I was 12 years old, my sister gave me a computer. And uh, I just fell in love with it and I started coding website. I was also very much into Japanese music at that time. So uh, I started um, following Hansel Wai Mei Wai. And I started, oh, if I like her so much, I might as well like, make a website for her. So I started a website and it grew into um, um, a music sharing like MP3 website. And I thought it was really annoying for me to have to upload all the songs to servers all the time. So I decided at around like 13 years old, I started writing my own search engine. And um, I still remember um, at that time, every single day when I went to class, I would just like, I couldn't, I would fall asleep in the class all the time because I'd be working all night long, writing my own programs, writing my own search engine to crawl all the Japanese sites in the world and basically have, help people find their music um, from Japan. And at that time, like, it grew to become um, the biggest Japanese music search engine. And, um, and it was before Napster. And um, so basically at that time, um, I figured probably, maybe, it's good for me to go into the computer field. Maybe I should study computers. So I decided to go to a university in Illinois, which is where Prasanna goes to as well. And um, I studied computer engineering there. And uh, while I was studying there, um, at that time, um, Facebook and MySpace hasn't come out. Friendster was out for a while, Sanyo was out for a while, and there was absolutely no place for people to share photos at all. So I came up with an idea. I thought it would be good for me to basically create a website and mash up all these ideas together and basically allow people to share unlimited photos for free and at the same time they can write, write their own blog and they can find their friends so on and so forth and doing that was basically it was before Facebook no one has done it before so it was pretty groundbreaking at that time and I launched it when I was um, still in the second year of my university um, after um, around one year um, I've got uh, one million users before hiring people um, so that's sort of how I started the site. And um, I still remember um, at that time, uh, I was trying really hard, you know, going to the States. I was trying to find a job there because, like, being someone from Hong Kong, my dream was to work for Microsoft or Google, big companies, and climb up this 
the corporate ladder and, and, and be important, you know, in big companies. Um, and I tried really hard for that. I interviewed like 30 jobs in order to get my first internship. And um, and then, but then after that, like, I was doing this site meaning to find a job for me because it probably looks good on my resume and probably can find help me find a job. But then eventually I got offers from Microsoft and Expedia, but um, the company already has um, pretty significant size at that, at that time, so I decided to just reject their offer and stay with my company and, um, and then work on it. So that's, uh, that's the first lesson. I was told that I need to put them into like a lessons format so that you guys can absorb it a little easier. So my first lesson is that like you need to find your passion and be good at it. Um, I started at a very young age and it's because the environment, my family, like people around me, they allow me to be who I am and to write programs and do what I like. And that's why um, I was able to do my search engine, made it up, made it up money myself to go to the States for college and then that's why I started Zorpia, the social networking site. <clears throat> so I included two examples here as well for Apple and Microsoft. Um, it's, I think they have pretty similar background story as well in a way. Uh, Steve Jobs, he's very famous of doing like the user interface very well, designing very elegant you know, uh, products, and there's a reason for it. Um, his life-changing moment came from uh, him taking a calligraphy course, so that basically um, by making use of different fonts, you can present information better, so on and so forth, and um, and that's basically how like what got him to focus so much into visual designs and elegant product design. Whereas for um, Bill Gates, he worked on uh, he was given a chance to um, work in a computer lab at that time, and you know in this world. At that time, like in the 70s, um, there's basically no computers, and there's only like the computers are all sitting in labs. And he was lucky enough to get into a lab like that, and then he found his passion. He used their computer and code all the time, and from there, Microsoft was founded. So that's why I think it's very important for for us um, to find passion and be good at it. Something it's something that I think Hong Kong students always have um, problems. And uh, doing this because, like, the Hong Kong education system often uh, crush this kind of ideas, or they don't allow you to be creative, and they just want you to follow a set rules and stuff. And so, I, I really encourage you to just love what you do and do well with it. So, um, okay. So basically, I'm going to go back to my story again with Zorpia. So initially, I started the site when I was in sophomore and second year of my university. And uh, the first question that I had was, how do I promote the website? How do I make users use it? Uh, so basically, how uh, I started Zorpia was um, I, I had spent a year on writing the website myself. And then I hired um, several like promoters. And they would set up booths in different universities in Hong Kong. Uh, we did it in Poly University and Chinese University, Hong Kong University, and basically we would have a booth with like three computers on their laptops, and people can can sign up and and join the website on the spot. And uh, that was uh, 2003 December, and uh, basically every day 50 people would join the site, and I I, I ran that uh, event for like six days, so we've got like 200 users. Um, or like 300 users from that event, and basically that's a seat for the website. And um, from there, um, those people started inviting their friends because, as I was saying, like um, people haven't seen anything thing like that before. There's no site for people to share photos, unlimited, free. Uh, there's no place that you can have your blog along with your photos, and let alone we only have friends at that time. There, you can't really add your friends or check your friends' photos, so it was it was pretty popular. It was instantly popular. We started in Hong Kong, and um, I I was in the States at that time, and then I and then basically I remember there's one time I was going to spring break and going to have parties there, right? Every single uh, spring break, people would go to different cities in the States, and I was I was in Miami drinking and having lots of fun. But then suddenly, like I got like emails from from my phone 
saying that like there's some issues with the site. It went down. So I was sort of like freaking out, you know, went to the uh, internet cafe and I realized that there were so many people going to the site. 2,000 people suddenly started joining the site every single day. And the site crashed and no one could use it at all. And I was just like really nervous at that time. So, so I was in a, uh, you know, in a, in a web internet cafe trying to fix that website. And then I realized that it got very popular suddenly in, in Singapore. So basically some people in Hong Kong uh, uh, invited their friends um, to, how do I use the pointer? Uh, you want to go click one of these two buttons. Oh, there you go. Okay. So yeah, so it started from Hong Kong and then it go to Singapore and then that was like crazy, crazy traffic in Singapore. And then from there, it went to the Philippines uh, in Manila. And uh, probably because of the heritage of the people in Manila, you know, they're Spanish-based, um, it, it went all the way to Peru. And then we saw like similar explosions, like 5,000 5, people joining per day from Peru, out of nowhere. And then from Peru, it went to Caribbean Sea, you know, um, and then from there, it went straight into uh, the States from Florida. And then from the States, it went to like the UK and uh, so on and so forth. It went to Turkey and Middle East and uh, it spread to India. And India is where we're biggest at now. Um, as I was saying, um, some these are some of our milestones. Like we reached 100, uh, 1 million users in 2005 and 10 million in 2008. And um, it was pretty good at that time. Um, so my second uh, lesson with NB, be responsive to trends to create opportunities. Uh, if you look at different products outside, for example, Farmville, um, it's it basically like nowadays for many products, um, they basically it's not like genuinely original idea. They basically just mix and match different ideas and form new products out of it. Farmville is a very good example of it. I mean, like farming games, they've been going on forever. Um, Nintendo has those games, and um, but then Zynga released this game and put it on Facebook and added social components on it. Have you invite your friends, play the games with you, and they become very popular, and now they're listed. What's that? A uh, similar story. I mean, everybody needs to text. But then there's a problem, like why do you have to pay $1 for each text? So there's these smart guys like from Europe, so they start WhatsApp, so everybody could just text for free. Instagram, even a better example. Um, you know, in 1963, uh, Kodak released um, the first you know, instant camera. It actually looked like that. It's called the Instamatic. Um, and people would take photos, and those are really stylish and you know, hippie photos, and very popular at that time. Um, and then the popularity went down. So Instagram came up and basically just took this idea and put it on the phone. And now they got bought by Facebook, one billion dollars. So um, that's sort of like um, what I'm trying to say. Like um, it's important to be responsive to market trends, to your company trends, and uh, good ideas can come up from mixing and matching different technologies into different ideas. So, um, so, so, so far, um, I guess uh, in terms of Zorpia, I'm in around like I'm talking about like 2005 now, and at that time, I got uh, the site got really popular, and that was definitely one of the first sites that came out. That was um, around uh, Facebook was still in college stage; uh, they haven't gone to Hong Kong at all. MySpace was getting popular, and um, and so. So I've got lots of, um, you know, I, I did lots of press at that time. I went to um, different newspapers. I went to different talk shows. Liu Youyuan is like the biggest uh, talk show in China, and I was like completely happy about it all. Since I was young, I've always dreamed about like doing these kind of things and be reported and stuff. And I got there, and I started to think, um, 
I've done everything already at that time, which was not exactly true, but that's what I felt at that time, so I felt complacent, and I stopped. Basically for um, like three to four years after that, I wasn't really pushing the company very hard. I was just happy with what I'm doing, and so there you go. Facebook got listed. <laughs> MySpace got really popular and they crashed. And um, and then, um, so I really struggled with myself. And I was asking myself all the time, like now, what do I do? I've copied other sites, I've made a site. Sure, millions of people are using it, but then what? What is this product? What am I doing? Where am I going? Um, so I started talking with my friends. Um, there's this friend that I met a long time ago from the UK, his name is Scott. I started telling him that I've lost my direction, I don't know what to do. And so he also started his own business at that time. And then, um, and then he started talking with me and say that, well, maybe you should come to the States. You know, go to Silicon Valley, people there are really excited about doing these kind of businesses and you're probably gonna be inspired. And I was just like, man, I wanna go, I just wanna be alone, and you know, like, I just wanna be myself and work on the company. And uh, I was in that phase for quite a few years. So all, it was like that, until I watched the movie, The Social Network. Has any of you watched that movie? Yes. Yeah, right? So, watching that movie is inspirational to me, because basically, my background story is like Mark Zuckerberg. We both um, started in a university. We both started our website in sophomore year. We both uh, wrote our first web website in the dorm room. And he went to Silicon Valley. He got invested like 10 million right away. And then, and then Facebook got really big. So watching the movie, I was questioning myself what I've been doing these few years. Why was I so useless? And they're like, I have a team here. I have a website here. Why am I here? So I started thinking, started thinking about where I want to go, started thinking about what I want to do with the business. So, um, so then, um, applying the second lesson that I just talked about, um, I started looking into different trends on the website again, and different you know, uh, news, and I tried to look at what we can do. So I realized um, Facebook, um, they're a website for people to connect with friends. People go there, they upload their friends' photos, they upload their own photos, so that you would go and check and up and see your friend's status and be connected, right? Um, so that's what they're good for, and because of that, they replaced MySpace. At that time, MySpace was a very dominant platform as well before, my, uh, before Facebook, and many people were there to you know make friends and meet new people, but MySpace went down. So there's a big hole in the market. What are we gonna do? Like nobody, nobody is providing this platform anymore, and that's where sites like us, especially Zorkia, um, I see an opportunity there. And then I started also studying uh, Zorkia, the usage case. I realized that people come to Zorkia, the site, don't actually uh, to connect with friends they already know. They come here to meet friends all over the world. Um, I, like, like they would meet dates within the same cities, and I've also heard different marriage cases. There's like a Singaporean girl met a guy in, in, a, in the States in San Francisco, and she got married there. There's this uh, British old guy, 80 years old. He met so many friends, like 100 friends on Zorpia. And uh, he decided that he would just travel around the world, for, to Australia, to the United States, he, to Asia. He visited me as well and basically to meet all these people he met on the site, and now he's writing a book about it. So what I saw is a very different usage case than Facebook. So I realized that there's a market, people are using it, and there's a hole. We will be uh, the network for people to make new friends. And so that's where our vision came from. Um, So um, yeah, in order to build that vision, like everything sort of sort of just come together. I realized that in order for people to meet their friends, it's not so important that 
um, you know, certain features are really good or whatever. Like at that time, I realized that basically, if a platform, if a network has many people, then you would get to meet as many people as you want. You get responses and stuff, um, and that would be most important for a social network to gain traffic, to grow. And that's basically um, the differentiator of um, sites like Sorkia from other dating sites. Dating sites, usually like Match.com or like the whole Yahoo personal, um, they, they, they charge people whenever you need to message people so that like they don't have a big pool of users. Um, whereas uh, when you don't have a big pool of users, it's really hard for you to meet the people that you want. How we differentiate ourselves is that we would have all kinds of people on the site for free to message. Um, and that's how I think the best way is to meet people. Um, so having that vision was really exciting. I remember at that time, like I, I would think at night, and I would just, just like get really excited about the vision, and I would just like share with my friends. And if I am to describe that kind of feeling, it's like there's like this little very beautiful box, and I know that there's something very very cool inside. And basically, our whole team, like all our members team members would be trying to peek into that hole and see what kind of secret in it is in there. And that's exactly how I feel when I get that vision, when I see it. And it was extremely empowering. And um, I was able, I, I guess that kind of feeling sort of like spread to my coworkers and everybody became very, you know, excited about the idea and about work as well. So um, I guess this is my third lesson. Um, cruising along is not acceptable for entrepreneurs and it's very important for you to think big and have a grand vision, um, not just for saying, and it's important that like when you have um, you know, such a vision, that's how you motivate people. I think that's sort of why um, most of my employees have been with, it, with me for like one of five years. And uh, well, these photos here basically I was just trying to give an example of, of what I was saying that like you know in Hong Kong um, the education system they are really close and they just want you to study and study and study sometimes it's really hard to think out of the box and uh, even for me I struggled for at least six years just trying to figure out what the company should do and it, 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 First, I, I'm glad that I was able to do it, to be so confused for six years. Um, but at the same time, I, I guess I was blessed that I was able to just look at the site, look at how people are using the site, and I actually listen to the users and look at the news. And it's only from there, and talking with people, that I started having this vision. If I was doing all those things, I wouldn't know where the company is going. I wouldn't have a vision at all. So. I think everybody here, um, even though we came from the same education, but, um, but I think you can come up with your big idea as well. And that's my point. Okay. So, um, basically, uh, for the company, you know, initially, uh, this is where we are. This, this, this was where we are when we got all the press and talk shows and everything. And then um, people started forgetting it, and then like we were here for a long period of time. And then that's when I realized that I need to have a passion uh, and a vision uh, for the company. And this is a graph, um, a very famous graph describing the process of running a startup, and it's done by Fred Wilson, a very famous uh, New York-based uh, venture catalyst. And um, this is how the company goes, and in terms of uh, this, you know, the feelings, and you know, being an entrepreneur is not so much about business. There's a lot about managing your own emotion, and a lot about actually doing things as well. And this is a curve for the personal mind state. Um, and that is where I was. I figured out the vision. Very excited, very naive. I think I can conquer the world. I was very excited. That was uninformed optimism. 
So then um, I went to the States. Uh, no, but before that, like I was talking with uh, my friend Scott, right? So uh, I was telling him how I lost my ideas, like I just didn't know where to go at all. So he encouraged me to start looking at the side, uh, different sites and different news and started watching that movie. I got really inspired and then I, I came up with the new vision. Very excited, the, the company was growing well as well, stats were good, many millions of people are joining. So I went to the States and Scott helped me a lot like in these kind of situations. He, he introduced me, um, he showed me like what kind of events that we need to go to and what kind of um, people that we need to meet. So basically he just introduced me to several people. And eventually like the, the responses when I was in the States was overwhelming. Like people had never heard of Zorkia, they never realized that there is such a site with like so many users and many big named people came and meet, met me. Like uh, the founder of Hotmail, Gmail, people that invested in Facebook, Twitter's investor, um, Skype's founder, basically they all met me and they were all very impressed and they wanted to meet me more. So I was again very excited. I was also interviewed by CNN and I, and I was just going crazy. I was alone in the States, very excited. So I thought, okay, this is probably my time now. So I went back to Hong Kong. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Yep. So, uh, so having all those meetings, going to conferences, I, I went back to Hong Kong. Five days later, the site crashed. <laughs> so basically, there's some kind of technical issues on the site. Our emails were not going out for one month. Our traffic dropped by two thirds. Like sixty percent of our traffic gone. So everything that I was like going crazy at in the states, I was impressing everybody. It all went to shit. <laughs> and then I was like really, really upset at that time. I was just like alone and uh, I didn't know what to do at all. And it was just really upset, upsetting for me. And every day there was like emergency, you know, meetings at the office and we were trying to come up with new ways to revamp the site, this or that. And so along the way, that was like one and a half years ago. Along the way, we tried many things. We launched like Facebook ads, we, we, we tried our uh, mobile lab, we tried different things and they all failed. And it was just like terrible. It was like no matter what I did, everything was fail, failing and that's exactly where we were at here. <laughs> and then uh, in terms of my mentality, this is where I was. For one whole year, everything was going downhill and he joined. <laughs> and um, so then, basically a few months later, our cash ran really low. There's no money running a company anymore. It was really scary. Like when you actually run a company, when you look at the financials, when you look at the money and you realize the money are going away and there's no way that you can get the money back, everybody is looking at you in the company. and. They expect you to give them answers. He asked me things and I'm just like, what? I don't know, what do you think? Yeah. That's how I reacted at that time. And it was um, also like my partner, um, who's also my dad, um, basically he told me that I should just close the website. He didn't see anything. It's not making money. So I was really, really upset at that time. Um, and um, I, would, I would just like cry and go to my friends and just be really upset every single day. I wake up in the morning and I wouldn't be able to work at all. I would just go into the shower, take like two hour shower and just go there and be in the fetus state and just couldn't move at all for a whole morning. It was really terrible. Um, all my friends or some of them are saying positive things. Many of them are saying that, well, you know, what you should do, you know, it's difficult. Um, so, and that's where I was. And in terms of the company, that's where I was. It was going downhill. So I was basically searching online. I was trying to figure out, okay, I'm going crazy. What am I going to do? I was searching online. I realized that there are actually many entrepreneurs that have gone through stages like that. And that's called the trove of sorrow. I don't think it's mentioned here. And so basically at this point, there's only two ways you can go. 
either you crash or burn. The whole company just die and nothing happens anymore. Or maybe if you're lucky enough, you learn something and you come back. Um, so basically at that time I realized that I probably need to sell my company. Uh, but it's the worst time to find people to sell your company, to buy your company when your company is not doing well, right? But I did it anyway. I used my previous experience, I used my previous uh, connections. I started talking with different you know, founders of sites like mine. Um, and uh, turn out there are actually many sites, many dating sites, many people meeting sites out there. I just basically, I use my connection and I talk with every single CEO of them, and trying to get them to buy me. And on the way, I started studying their stats. I started studying how many people would return daily, how many people would return monthly, how long they're staying on the site, you know, um, are they mostly using the website or their mobile app, or how are they making money, so on and so forth, how many percentage of the income comes from advertisement, how many percentage comes from um, you know, uh, their virtual economy, how many comes from subscription. I started studying into those. Some of them are listed companies as well. So, so I can just debate with them on these kind of things. And basically from that process, I realized, first, I need to cut cost of the company so that we don't bleed that much. Second, we're actually in a very lucrative industry. This industry, the companies that we're talking with, they're making like 100 million, at least 100 million a year. The second biggest one was like earning 40 million per year. And I was talking with them. I realized that the site is basically the same. The way I run the company is basically the same. But there are just certain things I missed, which are the returning users. People come to Zorpia, they don't come back. So I started meeting with my coworkers. I gave them instructions. And we talked. And we realized that like the best things for us to do is to just basically come up with ways to bring all the users, old users back. After all, 25 million users, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I mean, basically in English it means that like with 25 million users you can't get too bad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, so basically, that's what we did over the last um, like few months, and we focused just on that. And uh, our, our traffic doubled, our revenue tripled, cut, our cost cut was cut by 40%, and we're nearly profitable again. So, um, so that's where we are now, and um, which brings me to my next. Lessons. Fourth lesson, don't be secretive. Share your ideas with people and make friends. As I was saying, for a few years, I was too proud of myself. Um, I think I was too good. And so I didn't share with my friends or anybody or even about, about, about the company, where it's going, what we're doing. And we stalled. Um, I think many people, especially first-time entrepreneurs, had that problem. I always meet people like that. And I would talk with them. And hey, what are you doing? Secret project. <laughs> you know, that's always how it is. And I'd be like, come on, you know, I'm not gonna steal your idea. I have my own business. There's way too many things for me to do anyway. I'm not gonna listen to your idea, do it, and then copy you and be bigger than you. No, that's not gonna happen. And and 99% and, and of the time that idea was a shitty idea anyway. That's why <laughs> you don't need to be secretive about it. Being not secretive, um, you share your idea, you can actually get lots of feedback about what you're thinking. And uh, in, that, in that way, your ideas and your direction for the company and your projects can evolve much faster than you can save the five years that I wasted if you actually share with people. Not to mention sharing with people actually help you um, meet your friends. As I was saying, uh, my friend, my good friend Scott, I didn't meet him um, because he was doing things that are very wonderful. He was just a general friend who was running sort of like a, a, a C-level person in, in a telecom company in the UK. Um, he wasn't a startup person, 
but then I just share with him about like my difficulties and turnout. He introduced me to all the big people in the states that no one I would have never imagined I could do that. So um, yeah, so sharing can help you make connections, and I think that's very important. The fifth lesson um, is that it's very important for entrepreneurs to build your you know support network. It can come from everywhere. Um, personally, I find support from coworkers, family members, um, or friend or girlfriends, your partners, and your friends are very important. And uh, when you're running a company, there are always people close, probably the closest people, who tell you to give up. And that happens. And if you really believe in what you do, then you need to find a way to make sure that you can screen those words out. And basically, but understand why they're saying that at the same time, but don't be affected by them mentally, because it's all about that game. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> so basically what I did was that I, I spotted like a bunch of people, friends that are always supportive and positive, and I've become good friends with them. And what I have to say is that like for my coworkers, they have never left me. All of them have been extremely supportive all along. And um, basically, after so many crises, um, we've grown to a level where I don't even tell them what to do. Basically, I just tell them, OK, we're seeing a drop in this area. What do we do? I think there's a problem with that you know, user flow, and I can't really use the site that way. What do you think we should do? And after all, my coworkers are actually the people that know the website the most. Many of them, like combining the, all of them, they know way more than me. So, I mean, support from them, both from mental side of things and you know, um, from technical, it's also very, very important. And um, so, I'm really thankful for my team, and they're here, looking kind of bored. <laughs> uh, but um, that basically concludes um, my little talk, and uh, here are the takeaway. If you want, you can copy them, and I'm now ready to take questions. So uh, <clears throat> I, I think this feels almost like my, my class. Uh, because you talk about entrepreneurship and uh, all this, uh, how you experience all this process. Um, my question actually uh, came from the discussion during lunch. So I was uh, in the lunch, and uh, so Jeffrey basically said he managed a team in China where all these engineers they they work at home, and uh, um, so basically you don't have an office, and uh, they they connect through MSN. And uh, you have 20 people working together. So, so I, I, I feel that's quite amazing. So, so basically, can you tell us a bit more about uh, how to do this? OK. So these are our main team members. Paul is right over there, product. And uh, I've got a manager in, um, in Beijing. Uh, and Calvin is in Hong Kong. He, he handles all the servers. Um, and basically, uh, we have seven people in Hong Kong office, and we just work face to face. We have four people in the Philippines, and they all work online. And, uh, and then we also have um, around uh, 50 at least 10, like 12 uh, co-workers in China, and they're all from different cities um, in China. Um, it's a very cost-effective way to run a company when everybody is working at home. Um, so the way we handle it is that everybody would have to get online on MSN every single day. We set a time from 10 to 6, that's their working hour they would have to work. And they're all like 100% uh, responsive during those period of time. And if they're not, they would get warnings or terminated. Um, but basically, for um, engineering, um, that's workable for us for five years. Um, I mean, for for eight years. I mean, like uh, because most of the things that um, 
people do is that they have to focus and they have to write their own programs anyway. So the construction instructions would come from Paul, from different project managers, and they would write specs uh, explaining how the feature should go, and then they would take the spec, implement it, and come back for us to test. So basically, that's the same as any other you know uh, software or what the development companies, um, only that like it's online. Um, a problem is that like uh, they wouldn't be so engaged in like working with you, and they wouldn't understand uh, the vision so well. Um, and uh, in terms of the efficiency and productivity, like there's really two sides about it. Um, when people are working at home, they can focus, but there's no interaction. So it's good for projects that are individual. Um, so basically, we would have our team meet up every three months to talk about the projects and basically to allow them to co collaborate. And those are usually the screaming time. Everybody would be like talking with each other like crazy. And um, and that's usually the first two days. Afterwards, everybody would go silent and they would work on their own thing anyway. So um, that's how sort of how we balance uh, the you know working on your own at home issue with having too many too many you know distractions working at an office. Um, and then coming from a CEO's perspective, it's really important that I can convey you know um, the vision of the company uh, to the people. And uh, in China or people that are afar, like you wouldn't be able to go to a smoke break with your coworker and talk about shit, you know? Um, so basically, what I did is that I would have routine calls with them and just basically update them what we're doing with the website, how the steps are going, basically give them like positive encouragement and saying that this part is doing well and it's contributing to this part of the whole vision. And then I would reiterate this vision and help them understand what we're trying to do. And so that's basically how I handle the team remotely. Uh, so, so follow-up question. Basically, uh, you uh, you told me uh, most of these engineers they they're like uh, working for your for five years. Yeah. And how do you retain these people? And uh, when you have to swap, uh, when you have to you know fire people, how, how do you fill these positions and to make sure the new guys will have the same vision? Okay. Um. Okay. First of all, uh, somehow like. Uh, Every single year, we have um, like a company trip. We've been to, I'm not exactly sure if that's the main way, but that's one thing. Uh, we would go to different cities, different places in China to visit. So every single time for at least one week in a year, everybody would drink and mingle and have fun. And basically, when we're together, as much as there's work, you know, discussions sometimes heated, but there was never like fights, never really politics or anything in our company. And that's a good thing with a, with a small company as well. And through all those trips, um, what I see is that they're just a, we're just a bunch of very close friends doing something that we all like. So, so far, um, there are very, very few people that actually left our company. Uh, most of the people are fired by me, <laughs> and uh, they're not performing well. And um, so when people do leave, I mean, uh, my, my motto, my, my theory is that, like, I used to, a long time ago, I would just basically keep hiring. I would um, I would make sure that like whenever there's a hole here, I would fill that hole right away. And then as, as time goes by, I realize that it's actually not that important to fill that hole right away. It's more important that you find someone that's uh, you know suitable for the job than to find someone to just fit that hole now. Um, that's one thing. And another thing is that we also changed our interview project uh, process. Uh, initially, for all our engineers or all our other positions, like we focus very much on the technical ability of them. We get the written tasks. We like all interviews were technical. Um, and then I realized that like that's not good enough. So I started changing the interview process, and I told my guys like the first interview screening, you have to ask them whether they use the site, or if they don't use the site, do they use any other social networking sites? dating sites and make sure that like only people either have tried our site or are actually passionate in sites like us would join us. 
So that little change in the interview process changed a lot. We did that like three or four years ago. And basically, um, people before that, they're passionate in technology. They like to write programs. They like to work. Very hardworking. But they, they're not really aligned with the vision. People after that, they're all just pumped up with the vision. And they also have the technical ability. When it's very different when you hire people that actually understand the industry and actually use the product that you're using. Um, it, it, it makes lots of communication like redundant. Bas basically, like we don't need to check you know, errors as much. Whereas before, all kinds of errors can come up because they don't use the site. They don't even know how people are using it. How can they write something good, right? So that's how I solved that problem. I hope that answers your question. Jeffrey? Yes? Well, I think Hello. firstly, thank you very much. Thank uh, you for having me. <laughs> very inspiring story. So uh, congratulations as well. Uh, the success so far. What we were looking at. Uh, Jeff <laughs> a couple of questions I have. Sure. So you mentioned about uh, the popularity in India, right? Oh. Um, and uh, Facebook also has a lot of users. Yes. Of course, I'm a part of you as well. Sure. Um, how do you see monetizing that uh, in that space? Okay, that is a very difficult question right there because I, I, was, I was always like, chatting with other entrepreneurs and India is very much a market that is ignored. People are actually... And it's very difficult to get any money out of Indians. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, so basically what I see is that um, I will answer this question from two sides. I will first explain how we make money from India. Um, we work with different advertisers, um, including Google and a few Shadi. Shadi is a matrimonial site. It's a dating site for people to find their wives in India. And um, basically, we work with these sites, and, and, and we place advertisements on our site. And when they click on them, we get money. And uh, as simple as it sounds, actually, after talking with all those other sites that, that are sort of like our rivals, um, they focus on different areas, but the majority income uh, flow comes from that. It's still predominantly advertisement. So that's basically how we make money. And in terms of um, it, when it comes to online advertising, there is a very important key term called CPM. So it's the cost per thousand impressions. So basically, uh, uh, yeah, that kind of explains it all, right? So the CPM for India is actually not that bad. Uh, it's about like one fifth of the states, um, but it's still a double of China. So it's still good enough. So basically, India is such a big country. What we're trying to do is that we would monetize it with this large user base and you make use of the uh, you know economy of scale and try to squeeze money out of it. And um, at the moment, uh, from what I see and discussing with other people, uh, I don't think that it's too mature um, to, to to charge people for subscription or like you know for coins, gold coins at this point. Because um, their because uh, their payment system is not very well developed yet. Also, like the government sort of has some kind of law and regulation that prevents um, people from even taking money out of the bank account from, from from India, and that problem is sort of like China as well. And so that's why we haven't really got into like local development yet. So that's the first part of my answer. I'm sorry, I'm a very long-winded person. Second part: Why we probably like. Uh, if we are to monetize India with the economy of scale, first we need to answer the question, how do we get to here with India? So basically what we realize is that, is that like, um, for Zorpia, uh, most of our growth um, comes from emails. We send different kinds of email notifications to the users. We tell them when they receive a message, so on and so forth. So um, we realize that, like, um, India is very, very different from other places in the world, especially China. They love emails. Uh, their research about Indian, you know, internet traffic 
uh, the most favorite activity in India is checking emails. 98% of the people like to check emails and do it every single day. So that's why we focus on basically on that one area. And then, so that's why somehow India grew to the top. And where is, where is your focus now? I mean, India being such a big uh, country, of course, market, of course. Is your focus like uh, in any, or any particular region, or you're like looking at more of uh, a vision of? So far, we have been looking at growth um, by features, by different ways to get people by different channels. Like when it comes to emails, you use Gmail, you use Hotmail, you use Yahoo. When it comes to different other platforms, we use Facebook, we use mobile phone notifications. And those are different channels that we look at. Um, but I think it's very important. Uh, we've been developing more and more, focusing more on the Indian side as well, trying to research, talking with the users there, try to understand what they, what they're doing, you know, um, but we're still pretty young in that area, and we would definitely need help <laughs> on growing, you know, particular region. Um, whereas uh, I feel like I understand uh, the American market a little better, and they're, you know, in a way, uh, pretty much pretty similar. Basically, we see uh, all those international markets that's a very similar way, and that's how other rival sites are doing as well, whereas for China, it's completely different. As I say, they don't use emails, <laughs> and uh, they, they use Weibo, and they use QQ, and all those things, so when we look at China, we need to, China is definitely a place that we have to have local teams to develop the website, and um, and that's sort of where, where our people are at, um, and uh, so basically for China, uh, we're not doing so much on email. We have to focus on like how to get users from Weibo or from other platforms and through other ways, not uh, emails. So we have to specialize for different countries, yes. Sure. Thank you. And one final question. So are you looking to go public or are you looking at uh... Well, we've just been through a very difficult time. Now we're now we're making now we're making more re revenue than ever, but I still think that that question is a little too far for me at this point. But hopefully one day I will, or maybe, I don't know, I mean like, maybe I'll sell the company, or maybe, maybe not know. That's why I like, um, I focus, that's why I give these, uh, I, I very much enjoy like my time here to meet people, and hopefully something will get out of this. Maybe some of you will be a banker that helps me go IPO in one day, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, actually, thank you for your sharing today because uh, thank you. Uh, especially uh, for Hong Kong people, uh, what, what we are mostly thinking from starting a business may not be through IT. Yeah. Because IT business for startup is not that easy. Mm. And it's easy to run out of money. Uh, run out of money. Mm. Because, uh, and, and by, by the way, uh, for social networking side, uh, because uh, when time goes by, um, I think people may have uh, they change their inches easier. Mm. Say for example the ICQ. Yes. When I undergraduate, uh, every people like ICQ. But uh, when time uh, is passed, uh, people may change their inches very fast. Yeah. So how can you uh, maintain and, and stay the people in your platform? How do you tackle so, this uh, situation in the coming future? Okay. Uh, so in the future, um, basically this field that we're in, we know that it's something that people need. Uh, we know that it's lucrative, and basically we just have to come up with different easier ways for people to meet new friends. Um, currently, we're still pretty predominantly on web, um, but then in the future we would need to look into develop lots of like mobile apps and make sure that they grow very well because like on mobile, I mean. Sure that you guys are using many apps as well. Um, you can easily find people that are near you um, and make friends with those people. And so those are definitely in terms of products where we have to go. And um, I think that like one day, like if we can build um, a platform that so many people are using, then it would make sense. Basically, once you log on, there'd be like. 10 or like 100 people messaging you all the time trying to make friends with you and that kind of fulfilled the purpose. I mean like 
and that is essentially what our business is all about. So um, I, when I think of this problem, I think largely on how to grow the membership, how to make sure that many people use the site so that the same feature can get very useful. Whereas, um, whereas we would also, of course, improve the products and release on different platforms and so on and so forth. Um, and that's particularly for our company. When it comes to running a company, uh, running any company, especially in IT, I think it's just very important for you to be open to all these things. Like, nothing will stop. Like, mobile just came out, like, probably five years ago. And now, especially in India, the traffic of mobile is already larger than web. And um, remember a few years ago, um, Gmail came out. And we were like, oh, it's so responsive, blah, 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 blah. Everybody was still using Microsoft Outlook. And, um, and so at that time, the whole you know, industry shifted from software to web, and then now to mobile. And that's just like a natural progression of the industry. And if you're actually passionate in this industry, then these changes are not going to be intimidating or hard to you. So that brings back to my first lesson. Be passionate in what you do and be good at it. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Jeffrey. Yes. I got a question. Yeah. Um, how much are you involved in coding now? I still can answer any single coding question. There is in the company, but I don't code anymore. We do have coding. Just focus on strategy more. Yeah. I focus very much. Um, I'm well. I studied computer engineering back in university. That's my background. So I'm just personally interested and passionate about these kind of technical challenges. So even though I have all these managers, even though they are the one who comes up with solutions of things, designing databases, coming up with you know programs or whatever, um, I would still make sure that I would talk with them and understand how the feature work, so that combining with my previous experience, I can still answer any questions that people have regarding any technical side of the website. And I think that helps me a lot, having this competence. I'm not good at other things. I'm pretty good technically. So that helps. Uh, about strategy. Uh, strategy. You, yeah. Um, you said you use advertisement as the main source of your everything. Yes. Do you have any ideas about how to get money from other sources? Like uh, yeah. your matching website. Yeah. You can do a whole service like you book the venue, you book the car, and they like you hold are these events for your website? Okay. Yes. Do you have other end of years like this? Yes. <laughs> so, um, for, you know, I was explaining, like, uh, basically, People Meeting Network is a new genre of the site. And there was this traditional, you know, dating site genre. And they're in Sh they're, they're on Shadi or Match.com or Yahoo Personals and different, you know, dating sites. And uh, for sites like us, we have a very different way to monetize outside of advertisement. Um, some other companies are actually using these features to drive more than 50% of their um, revenue. Some of them, a listed company I know, 90% comes from advertisement. So every company is different. But basically, here's um, what we're doing. Uh, we have a gold coin system on our site. People can buy gold coins. and. Uh, uh,